Good morning, everyone. I got to tell you, it is wonderful to be back here. Um, I miss this place so much when I'm gone. I miss all of you people so much when I'm gone. A lot has happened since the last time I was here. Um, I turned 50, so there's that. I know there are people in the audience who are in the congregation here who are thinking 50 is really old, and from your perspective, you're right. And I know there are those of you who remember fondly the days when you were 50 um, and still wish you felt that. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And you were also right. Um, I wasn't able to spend that 50th birthday with my family like I had hoped. I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan at a truck stop. And I happened to mention when I woke up to get my coffee that it was my 50th birthday. And the guy behind the counter said something really nice. He said, well, I have a feeling you're going to live to be 100. And I thought, wow. I said, well, what makes you say that? And he says, because you look about half dead right now. <laughs> um, turns out he wasn't as nice as I thought. Um, on a much more historical level, aside from me turning 50, which wasn't that big of a deal, um, we've all seen that we had the assassination attempt since I was here last. Um, the sitting president dropped out of the race, which is, doesn't happen very often, right? And then they nominated somebody else without a, any kind of primary vote. That's happened one other time in history. So these are historic events. They may not seem like it, but they're going to be remembered for years to come, but I'm not here today to talk about politics, I promise. Um, one of the things that's happened recently since I was here last is uh, the opening ceremony of the Olympics. Has everybody seen that? Um, if any of you who watch TV or have seen any kind of internet, I'm sure you're familiar with it. But there are a lot of believers who are outraged by this incident. And understandably, um, it seems to fly in the face of everything that we believe. This, uh, it, for those of you who don't know, there are a bunch of drag queens who did a portrayal of what was either the painting of the Last Supper of Christ or a Greek festival of the ancient gods of some sort. I think it was a combination of both. Um, there was a 10-year-old girl involved in the thing in a, in a very inappropriate manner. Um, but I'm here to tell you that on some level, we as believers shouldn't be outraged by these things because the Bible told us this was going to happen. Long before any of us were born, the Bible told us this was going to happen. We shouldn't be outraged because this is not a political issue. This is a religious issue. What they're pushing is a false religion. We make it about politics in our voting and in our news. It's the left versus the right or whatever, but really it's a religious issue. And like I said, it's not new. Long before the time of Christ, there were prostitutes in the temples of the false gods. You know, if you think back about ancient Rome and ancient Greece, they practiced all sorts of atrocities on a regular basis. Think of Sodom and Gomorrah. When those angels came to visit Lot in the form of men, the people of there gathered around the house and said, send them out, we want to get to know them. And they didn't mean shake their hand, right? Atrocities have been happening forever. There was a time when they say that the streets ran red with blood from sacrificing babies to Baal or Malak. We don't sacrifice our babies now in a way that the streets run red, but they're still being sacrificed to the false gods of pride and the idols of self by the thousands or even millions all the time. What is happening in our nation is not a political issue, it's a religious issue. It's an attack on Christianity. It's an attack on the truth. There are several lies that the father of lies wants you to believe, wants all of us to believe, and those lies are being spread rampantly throughout the world today. For most of history, a man was a man and a woman was a woman, right? That was how it was, and those were just simple truths. But now, people want you to believe that these fundamental truths are not so true, that it's up to that person to decide what they are. 
the underlying issue here with what happened at the opening ceremony and what we see every day in so many small other ways is an attack on truth. So what are the lies that society and the father of lies want us to believe? The first is that the Bible is not true. A lot of people want to tell us that the Bible is just a collection of fairy tales or at best a collection of stories that teach us moral principles like Aesop's fables or something. But we know that the Bible is truth. God has left his signature and even the grandeur of the smallest living thing. Aside from the grandeur that we can see, we know that the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses to Christ in his resurrection. We have historical documents outside of the Bible that confirm that these things happened. And then there's also the fact that science continually confirms the biblical story as much as they don't want it to, it does. Um, in spite of what they want you to believe, in spite of the fact that we see all these things, they want you to believe that the Bible's not true. How are they going to accomplish this? Because they place the emphasis on feelings rather than facts. I don't remember when it happened, but when I was a child, everybody said, I think something. Now people say, I feel like something. There was a shift. I didn't notice it when it happened, but it took hold. Nobody says, I think anymore. They say, I feel like. I feel like it's right over there, you know. It's a very different because the focus is on the feelings, not the facts. It's a shift away from what is true towards emotion. This leads us to the point where people can say, well, I have my truth instead of what is the truth, right? They would even tell you that there is no such thing as truth. I've heard people say this. The easiest way to combat that is to ask them simply, is that true? Because no matter which way they answer, it defeats their, their statement. If they say, well, yes, it's true, well, then you just made a truth, right? Anyway, you get the idea. Another thing they might say is, well, you have your truth and I have mine. The best way to combat that that I've found is say, is that true for everybody? Because again, it's a self-defeating statement, right? The current trend though is to focus on feelings and not facts. This is not true, or not new. It was around long before Christ. The ancient Greek Philosophers talked about this. It was all about improvement of self, right? And the ascetics, the asceticism that was found there was all about denying yourself pleasure so that you could become better spiritually. These ideas have been around for a long time. Um, I don't think that we should be outraged by these events, nor should be, we be discouraged by them. When we see the world falling apart, these events just signal that we're one step closer to the end. Ricky, I'm going to stay mostly in the New Testament for you today. One little dip into the, into the Old Testament, but let's turn to 2 Peter 3. If I can find it. There we go. 2 Second, Second Peter 3. And we're going to start at verse 1. We're not going to read all of it, but... He starts off, he says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. That's what we're seeing now, but that's what we've seen for generations, right? But the more it happens, I'd say the closer we are getting to the end. So we should celebrate these things. He continues and says, these people are saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, 
Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. His goal is that all men come into his will, into his way, and walk with him. So when we see the people doing these awful things, in our deepest innermost parts, in our heart of hearts, what we think is, how could those people be so evil? How could they be that wicked? How could they be that depraved? But as believers, what we should be thinking is, there but by the grace of God go I. I know that's hard to think, but the fact is, if we'd had a different situation in our lives, just ever so slightly different, if we hadn't had the people that influenced us to see the truth, then we might be just like them, just as sinful, because that's in our nature. It's not our goodness that keeps us from being like them. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling within us that allows us to discern the truth from the lie. So there, but by the grace of God, go I. Turn with me, if you will, to Jude. We'll start at verse 17. I like Jude because I don't have to say a chapter. Um, Jude, verse 17, it says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some, have compassion, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. He says that some we'll be able to win them with compassion and kindness. And some we might have to pull them out of the the fire, save them with fear. But saving them with compassion and love sounds a lot like the words of Christ, right? And let's turn to Matthew 5. His Sermon on the Mount, he said a lot of wonderful things. I'm just going to bring up one of them here. Matthew 5, we'll start at verse 43. He says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love him, them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That last, last one is a tough one to live up to. Being perfect even as our Father is perfect. But the rest of it is a little easier to follow. So if we can follow those other things, maybe we'll be just a step closer to being perfect like our Father in heaven. But he tells us to love our enemies. So again, this leads us to another lie that society wants us to believe. Society wants us to believe right now that approval is love, or that love requires approval that we have to approve of their sin or even celebrate their sin in order to show our love as a Christian. And you see this attack on Christianity all the time. Well, you're not being loving because you're saying what I'm doing is wrong. Let me tell you, love doesn't require approval. In fact, well, we'll get into that. But think about 
how Christ showed his love for us. He did it through his actions. It was his actions on the cross that showed his love for us. Let's look at John chapter 13. John chapter 13. We'll start at verse 34. Christ says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, you shall know, or by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So he gave us a new commandment to love one another as he has loved us. He loved us through his sacrifice. You see, love is action. It's not a feeling. Think of a, a marriage Feelings might be the catalyst. It might be the thing that gets the marriage going. But it's love that holds it together year after year. And love is not a feeling because feelings are fleeting. They can pass. They can change. But love is actions. It's steadfast care and protection and mutual respect. That's what love is. Love is such steadfast sacrifice throughout the years. And that's what Christ has done for us. And that's what we're called to do for others. Love is not a feeling, it's not approval. It's the same thing. They're trying to change the focus from facts to emotion, to feelings. To love someone does not mean that you approve of their sin. I know this for a fact because Christ died for me when I was still a sinner. I've done more wrongs than I care to think about, much less a list up here, right? But... Yet Christ died for me, and he died for you. We're all sinners. He didn't approve of our sin, but he loved us through his actions anyway. So when we're, when we're told to love our enemies, it doesn't mean that we have to approve of their feelings or of their sins. It means that we should act. We should witness to them and try with all kindness and humility to show them the error of their ways and direct them down the path that leads to Christ. That's what love is. Love is not approving of everything a person does. Any parent knows this. How many times, for those of you who are parents, did your children do something that you were simply appalled by? But you loved them, right? Because you showed them the right path. It wasn't just the feelings of, oh, he's so cute. Because at that moment, it wasn't very cute, right? I know my parents learned this over and over and over again. Um, but you see where I'm going with this? If, uh, if love is approval, then we have a big problem. Actually, I would say that approving of someone's sin is not loving them. It's loving yourself. Because really all you're trying to do is avoid the fight that's going to come if you tell them that they're wrong. It's brave to love them. It's courageous to love them as Christ told us to love them, which is to point them down the right path. So when these things happen, like what has happened in the last week or so, this attack on Christianity, I want to remind you not to be disheartened when you turn on the news. It was written in the Bible long before any of us was born. And it just confirms that our faith in God and in his word is rightly placed. The Bible has told us that this would happen. So what can we do in this troubled time? All right, for just a moment, I want to dip into the Old Testament. Let's look at Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is a short one, but it starts with, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now there are two words there in Hebrew that are translated as blessed or blessed. One is what God does to us. God blesses us. The other one, well that one is barakah, right? That's what God does for us. The other one is ashrai, which has 
It's more of something that we can observe. It's translated also as happiness. So when they're talking about blessed here, it's obviously prosperous, obviously successful, obviously happy. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. It goes on to say, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Now when we read this in our modern English, we think to block their path, right? Stand in their way. No, you can't do that. But when you look at the Hebrew, the word stand there is a mod, and it means to remain or to establish oneself. And then the word way is direct, which means path or trodden area. This makes me think of when I used to live in Wyoming. I had a, uh, a four-wheel drive truck. It was, uh, it was a nice one. I liked it. But I'd drive it up in the mountains, and all my friends thought I was crazy because it was... It was a nice truck. And they'd say, why are you driving it up there getting all scratched up? And I'd say, well, it's a, it's a truck. That's what it's for. But I'd drive it up there to scout out hunting areas. And these little two-track roads were always just deep ruts. Once you got into them, you were kind of stuck in them. Wherever the guy went before you were, you were taking the same path. Because there were these ruts, these trodden areas that you couldn't get out of. The first person to go up there after the snow melted left these ruts because it was a little muddy. And he'd just spin his way up there. And then the whole rest of the year, everybody was going exactly where he went, whether they liked it or not. Once in a while, you could take that truck and bump it up onto the high spots and maybe straddle those ruts. But eventually, you're going to slip back down into them, right? Anybody who's driven a dirt road in Oklahoma knows exactly what I'm talking about. But um, the thing is, when it, stands, it says here, don't stand in the way of sinners, that's exactly what it's talking about. It's don't remain in the lifestyle of these sinners, This can even mean avoiding being lazy. Sometimes it's easy as believers to slip back into the ruts of just not continuing in daily study and prayer. I'm going to close here. Let's go back to the New Testament for the book of Philippians. That's another one that's hard to find. I did that on purpose to find the ones that were uh, hard to find. When was the last time you had somebody turn to the book of Jude? From the, it doesn't happen very often. All right, let's look at Philippians chapter 2. We'll start at verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. When you see these things, in the world. Don't be outraged. Don't be discouraged. Be glad because it just confirms the truth of what we believe, the truth of God's word. And remember to just stay in his word. Keep yourself on the right path and all will be well with you. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together and share in your word and share in fellowship. We ask that you be with us in the coming week, that we can keep our eyes and our minds upon you, that we can always remember to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.